Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. We're um, actually taping this session. Uh, the questions will not be taped, the questions and answer sessions, so we hope that you'll have plenty of, plenty of questions and it'll be very dynamic. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to Building Expertise to Support Digital Scholarship. My name is John Cawthorn and I'm the Dean of Libraries at West Virginia University. And uh, my colleagues, uh, here are uh, Vivian Lewis, uh, University Librarian at McMaster University, and Lisa Spiro, Executive Director of Digital Scholarship Services at Rice University. Our colleague Shimu Wang, uh, the Dean and University Librarian uh, from Cincinnati, home of the Bearcats, right? He's, uh, <laughs> he's here with us in spirit. And while we all work in university libraries, it may be helpful to remember during this presentation our research goes beyond just libraries. We're interested in campus support, history, and the career structures needed to build digital scholarship centers now and in the future. The four of us have worked together for a little over two years on this preliminary planning grant funded by the Mellon Foundation. We are deeply, deeply grateful for, the Mellon, for this opportunity Mellon has provided. And of course, this topic is timely. In fact, at the last CNI, uh, the session on digital scholarship filled up so quickly we weren't even able to be uh, part of it. So uh, that's <laughs> how this goes. But we're curious uh, in the session, uh, how many people, just by a show of hands, how many people are, uh, how many people have a digital scholarship or digital humanities center on campus? Yeah, there's a, <laughs> so this question may be for you. Uh, how many are thinking about or uh, in the process of, okay, more, more people. Very good, thank you. This gives us just a quick snapshot of the interest in our varying institutions, of course. In the planning stages of our research, we had to start with the definition of digital scholarship. And we recognize early on that there's not a universally accepted definition for digital scholarship, but this is the working definition we used throughout the project, and I'll just read it to you. The creation, production, analysis, and or dissemination of new scholarship using digital or computational techniques. So our objectives were to define the expertise important to leading digital scholarship programs identify how digital scholars develop expertise. We wanted to identify key characteristics of organizations that promote continuous learning. And we wanted to understand digital scholarship expertise in a global context. And finally, recommend how, the best, how best to nurture expertise in digital scholarship. It's important to remember, of course, that the scope of our preliminary research has been global in context. Now we had a deceptively simple methodology as we sort of identified best in class in uh, digital scholarship organizations. We conducted on-site interviews and coded those interviews to reveal uh, patterns. From the beginning, our questions led our research design and process. For instance, does expertise look different in other parts of the world? Uh, do strategies used to build that expertise vary from place to place? We know that a tremendous amount of sophisticated work is being done in other parts of the world. And beginning to tell that story was an important starting point. The red dots represent locations of the sites uh, visited. While we ended up with 16 site locations, we visited multiple organizations within a particular institution. So for instance, a center uh, and lab focused on digital humanities, and we visited one that focused on digital social sciences and digital archaeology, and even one that was uh, focused on di high performance computing. Just like on many of your campuses, there are diverse models for digital scholarship organizations. And it is important to stress that not, there's not a single model for digital scholarship organizations. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> Dancing slides, okay. And you may have questions about how these sites were selected. But in the interest of time, I can say we researched over 100 different sites. And as you see, we based our decision on uh, many factors, the amount and quality of research, the uniqueness of their mission, 
And one important criteria for our team was the engagement in teaching and learning and research. There were limits and constraints to our research. Uh, first, we cannot make sweeping uh, generalizations. It's generally not good anyway. Uh, for, and, and you should view our findings more as a snapshot of these very dynamic organizations. Uh, so with this foundational introduction, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague Vivian Lewis. Um, thanks, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me at the back. If, I, if my voice starts to trail off, the gentleman in blue will, will remind me. Right. Thank you. Um, what I'll do in the next few minutes is really give you a very high-level overview of the expertise we saw at our various site visits, the strategies that we saw in use in building and retaining the expertise, and some common approaches that we saw to continuous professional development. And some of what I may describe might not seem that surprising to you, especially those characteristics which align neatly with our own North American experience. What is new here is actually the global perspective. This is in some ways our proviso statement. Uh, we could not produce a slate of skills, competencies, and mindsets that cover all the roles in all the different DSOs that we visited all around the world. Doing so would really have been an injustice to the complexity of the work happening in this space. What we can do is point to the common expertise that seems significant in many of the organizations that we visited. First, a, a quick statement about what we mean by the term expertise. And I promise you that in some ways, this is the most complicated slide in our deck. So stick with me. We view expertise really as the compilation of four kinds of traits or abilities. Domain knowledge, is the subject knowledge or the discipline knowledge. Uh, it, for example, the knowledge of Chaucer's work. By skills, we're referring to the more task-oriented um, and easily trainable um, traits. For example, the ability to use Excel software is a skill. Uh, by, uh, by way of competencies, we're speaking about more abstract abilities or fitness. Over the course of time, learning many different GIS packages may evolve into a broad geospatial competency. And finally, by mindset, we're speaking of a collection of attitudes, inclinations, or habits of mind that largely determine how an individual will typically respond in a given situation. And we use the, the examples of curiosity and flexibility as mindsets. In reality, these character, excuse me, these um, categories are more blurry than they read. The lines, for example, between skills and competencies are particularly fuzzy. But collectively, we believe they capture the full cluster of the expertise we were interested in when we traveled to all those various parts in the world. So what did we learn? Advanced domain or subject knowledge was identified as foundational at most of the DSOs that we visited. This knowledge was often, uh, but not always, evidenced by advanced degrees. We did meet a small number of very senior um, scholars who had come through different paths, but they were the aberration. We were often told that subject expertise is required to understand research problems, to critically evaluate data, and to effectively collaborate with peers. The notion of respect was also clear. You need knowledge to be respected in the profession to be brought into the global conversations. And this uh, deep knowledge seemed especially critical uh, in some of our international visits to China and India, where the DSOs are working with historical materials of deep cultural significance. In some cases, the expectation for deep subject knowledge was intense for faculty, but significantly less for staff, who tended to focus primarily on the technical skills. We, 
we intuitively knew that collaborative competencies were important. All job postings, of course, refer to them. But we were routinely surprised by the critical importance placed on collaborative competencies at virtually every location that we visited. We soon learned that collaboration and interpersonal skills are not rhetoric. They are not filler in the job postings in these DSOs. The teams doing truly groundbreaking work in, di in digital scholarship are genuinely and deliberately collaborative in their approach. They bake the collaboration into their grant proposals and into their daily practice. So remember, a mindset is a way of thinking. It determines how you behave in a certain situation. We met people around the world working in disparate projects in different languages, but who shared a clear learning mindset. They were curious and inquisitive people who were eager to try new techniques. The fast pace of technological change made a focus on continuous learning an absolute imperative. Uh, methodological competencies such as GIS and data visualization were often mentioned during our visits. Virtually all incorporate a deep understanding of how to compile, organize, and analyze data. Technical skills were actually a bit of a surprise to us. We expected them, possibly naively, to be more prominent in our study than they actually were. In reality, we could not identify a core set of technical skills. Programming was mentioned the most frequently. <coughs> uh, systems administration, database design, and web design often came up. And digitization was also often cited uh, especially by organizations in India and China, again focusing on presentation and analysis of heritage materials. And managerial skills really came down to two big traits, uh, project management broadly defined and grant writing. I'll now turn our attention to the strategies used by these DSOs to build and retain expertise on their campuses. Again, we saw some very clear trends, although the specifics vary based on the academic environments. We saw a very clear and strong preference for learning by doing. Our DS scholars are doers. They prefer to tinker with something rather than read a manual or take a formal course. And we did see some significant variation uh, in how the current leaders had developed their own expertise and what they saw as the needs of the generation coming after them. In many cases, these senior leaders were self-taught. Many of them were pioneers in their fields long before there were courses to register for. And that said, they were very eager to help the next generation of scholars uh, develop skills in a more formal way. Uh, by supporting workshops and summer institutes. The concept of community of practice was critical. Many of the people we <coughs> interviewed spoke about learn, do, teach as their mantra. In most cases, excuse me, in most places that we visited, the teaching was very democratic. One spoke of the, quote, egalitarian exchange of knowledge. When you hit a wall, it's great to be part of a community. It's energizing. The image on this slide comes from the University of Cologne's uh, Center for E-Humanities workshop on 3D scanning. We also saw what I would describe as a patchwork of practices regarding external learning. In some cases, it really was the faculty who got away to conferences. In many cases, there wasn't funding for the research staff to go as well. And finally, we were really struck by the passion many of the organizations we visited had for training scholars beyond their own institutions. I draw your attention to the University of Victoria's Digital Humanities Summer Institute, the DHSI, the Oxford Summer School, and the Dixit Training Network out of Cologne. Taking pride in the accomplishments of the entire profession was a hallmark of many of the organizations that we visited. 
Finally, I, I'll just speak very briefly about some interesting characteristics of the organizations we visited in relation to continuous learning. We talked already about the importance of collaborative skills, so it should be not surprising to learn that the organizations themselves are, are collaborative and open. As one leader put it, check your ego at the door as you enter. We're about open discussion. We establish a level playing field and bring in people from all over. These organizations are not working in silos. They're not working in isolation either. Rather, they're deeply engaged with international partners. We draw your attention in this case to, China, to the China GIS project um, led by Fudan University and Harvard as well as Stanford Humanities and Design Team's collaborations with Italy and Australia and others. Most of the places we visited were actively engaged in education and professional development on many fronts. They're training the next generation of scholars in many ways, through um, formal graduate courses, through certificates, undergraduate courses, etc. As one participant put it, they're placing their bets on future scholars. And finally, most were heavily invested uh, in creating collaborative spaces. Sometimes these spaces were highly polished, like myth, but not always. At this point, I'm actually going to stop, and I'm going to turn um, to my colleague, Lisa, who will really delve a little bit more deeply into the international aspects of our study, and then walk you through some recommendations. Can I have a little clicker so I don't no, lean too much? <laughs> so we had the rare privilege of going to China and India and Taiwan, Germany, the UK, as well as Canada, the US, and Mexico to explore the shape of digital scholarship in these different contexts. And that has afforded us the opportunity to kind of look across the world and, and try to determine some larger trends that are going on. At the same time, we are quite conscious that we only went to a few places around the world. So we're not prepared to make grand generalizations, but we do want to point to a few different characteristics or, or, or structures that inform the shape of digital scholarship, which we're kind of defining broadly to include digital humanities, which is, was our primary focus, as well as digital social science. We visited a few organizations that had work in that domain. So one uh, important influence on how digital scholarship takes shape in a, a particular national or regional context is the tradition of digital scholarship. So a lot of discussion around digital humanities in particular has um, popped up in the last, say, seven or so years in the United States, but of course the tradition is much longer, stretches back to the uh, late 1940s, according to, to many accounts. And we saw that in countries such as the UK and Canada, um, there is a long tradition of institutional or organizational support for digital humanities in particular, uh, with conferences, with centers, some of which have kind of come and gone with established professional roles. But in other contexts, that sort of organizational and professional identity is, is less mature. So for example, uh, Isabel Gaina and Ernesto Priani in Mexico have been looking at digital humanities there and observed uh, in, in studies that date back to, say, 2010, that um, although there are people doing work in this domain across Mexico, they didn't necessarily know each other. And they didn't have any kind of formal organizational support for that work. So one of the important things that they have done through an organization called Red HAD um, is to bring together scholars in that area who have an interest in uh, digital humanities and, and, and sort of build a network of people who can turn to uh, others at different institutions for help with their projects, who can think about how to evaluate uh, digital humanities work, and who can provide access to training. Uh, so a networked approach uh, seems entirely appropriate in this, this context. Um, of course, another characteristic of different kind of national level uh, digital scholarship operations is 
where the funding's coming from. Uh, because you know, where the funding coming, is coming from is going to affect the, the sort of research focus, as well as the sort of institutional support. So, for example, in Taiwan, uh, the, the government there, through uh, the National Science Council, um, has been funding digital archives programs since the late 1990s. Uh, and this involves not just digitization, but building the kind of fundamental technological infrastructure and, and networking people as well. Uh, in uh, the European Union, there are sort of transnational uh, research infrastructure programs, such as the Dixit Network that Vivian uh, mentioned, that really try to build um, both the, the, the sort of expertise and also the, the uh, sort of core uh, technologies to support digital scholarship. Um, now, one thing that I found personally most bewildering in uh, traveling to different contexts was just trying to understand how academic jobs work in these contexts. I mean, we're used to, at least uh, in, assuming that most of us in the room are from North America, we're used to a sort of standard structure of assistant to associate to full professor and, and research staff positions. But, but you can't assume that model is the same around the world. Uh, so Germany has uh, a, a fairly complex structure that isn't necessarily linear uh, and often will involve a stay as sort of a research fellow before advancing um, to more, more senior levels. Um, but they also try to provide support for young researchers through, for example, um, an e-humanities young research uh, program there. And um, I mean, it's important to note that tenure and promotion, which is a, a major concern in this context, doesn't necessarily exist in the same way around the world. Um, another factor in um, you know, how digital scholarship plays out in these different contexts is the, the role of the research library. So a lot of the discussions at, at past CNIs have focused on um, the, the ways in which research libraries are sort of the homes for digital scholarship centers and, and labs and so forth. Um, and we found that that model didn't necessarily apply across the world, that um, the library might be involved in, say, supporting digitization, but didn't necessarily have uh, a role in, in the sort of core um, research operations, um, with, with some exceptions. So those are just some general observations um, with, with all sorts of caveats attached to them. Um, I would also like to point to some common challenges around the world, one of which you might be able to guess is funding, right? So uh, not surprisingly, uh, a lot of digital scholarship organizations are fairly reliant on soft money, and that isn't necessarily abundant. So uh, some of them um, had sort of tenuous funding situations and, and, and were, were in some cases kind of shoestring or um, had to rely heavily on, on grants. But we also saw an interest in kind of diversifying funding, uh, including looking to research libraries as, as one possible source of more stable support and looking at more integration into the teaching and learning mission of the university. And again, where your money is coming from is going to, in part, affect the kind of direction of the expertise that you build. Related to this is something we, we particularly want to call attention to, this, this, these challenges around recruitment and retention. As Vivian noted, there's a really you know, specific skill profile uh, for uh, experts in digital scholarship, which include not only the technical and methodological expertise, but this passion for, for, for learning and for doing and for working together. And finding those people can be tough, especially given that the positions in which they're being recruited for don't necessarily come, and often don't come, with kind of stable career paths. Um, that you know, you're reliant on soft funding, they're, they're, they're short-term contracts. And you know, one of our interviewees uh, suggested that um, they were a member of the academic proletariat. Um, and, and this is something that causes anguish often to, to, to the leaders of digital scholarship organizations who wish that there were a path to promotion for these excellent people, but there's not that path to promotion. Uh, so often tech companies and um, other organizations had, had success in kind of luring away um, the, uh, 
digital scholars or in, in um, winning them from the get-go. Um, finally, or actually second to finally, uh, we noticed a, a sort of tension between research and uh, service. So, so um, most of the organizations that we visited were really explicit in saying, you know, we're about research. We're about creating new knowledge. Uh, and we don't really want to be involved in, in the service activities. Um, but there may be a call for that uh, at their home institutions. Uh, and there's also a tension between generating new knowledge and supporting your old projects. Um, so finally, given the global nature of our work, uh, we did notice some challenges around language. And this is something that's been a topic of conversation in the digital humanities community for the last few years. Uh, the, 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 you know, pointing out, for example, that most of the presentations at the major digital humanities conference are in English. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for scholars whose, whose native language is not English, there's often a, a sort of uh, choice between uh, doing your work in your native language and having a smaller audience, although we, we are seeing, you know, uh, organiz professional organizations focused on particular countries and language groups emerge as well as uh, journals and so forth. Or you can <coughs> present your work in English and it takes a whole lot more time to actually produce that work. So twice as long basically to, to write it and then to translate it. So given these, these challenges, we do want to point to a few recommendations. We have a list of 33. Um, but I will not bore you <laughs> by uh, explaining every single one of those recommendations. Um, rather, we want to point to three kind of general categories um, of recommendations. First, recommendations uh, aimed at leaders of digital scholarship organizations. And we use this term DSO. Um, it kind of reminds me of yellow. Um, but but the, the idea there is uh, to acknowledge that it's not just digital scholarship centers or labs, that there are diversity of models for digital scholarship. So in terms of digital scholarship organization leaders, um, we, we observed the really important role that leaders played in cultivating strong communities of practice, in cultivating a, a culture that embraced continuous learning, uh, and that includes being part of that community. So, so sort of um, continually learning yourself as well as providing the both financial and moral support for um, informal exchanges of ideas over coffee or a, a beer, um, as well as bringing in outside experts uh, to lead workshops or to seed new ideas. Also, um, a couple of the organizations that we looked at had sort of dedicated research time, recognizing that research is a core part of, of developing expertise and ongoing learning. In terms of uh, universities and host organizations, um, you know, our first recommendation for creating stable, rewarding staff positions may be easier said than done, but we, you know, given the, the challenges we noted around recruitment and retention, we wanted to call that out, um, at recognizing the important contributions that these uh, staff make to the uh, institution. Um, we also observed that um, some of the su more successful organizations had access to, to money, not a big pot of money, but some money that they could use if they, say, wanted to throw a workshop on 3D modeling, if that's an area um, of expertise that they wanted to cultivate. Um, and of course, you know, the tenure and promotion processes and other um, advancement processes need to evaluate this work um, in, in fair ways. Finally, in terms of the, the digital scholarship community, um, just in, in terms of grappling with these issues around different languages, uh, it, I think it's important, for example, in, in a practical way to provide adequate time when call for papers are issued uh, to make sure that if people choose to, to translate their work into English, they can do that. So this was a pilot study, uh, and there are lots of areas where the work can be expanded. Uh, we acknowledge, for example, that although we had the privilege of, of, of going to several different places around the world, there are a lot more that we 
could have gone to to have an even richer perspective on digital scholarship. So uh, we would have loved to have gone to South America, for example, or to have expanded our analysis in Europe um, and, and Asia and, and elsewhere. Also, I think it would be really interesting to have a, a sort of richer uh, transdisciplinary perspective. So we look primarily at digital humanities, a bit at digital social science, but to fold in, say, bioinformatics would allow us to see the different strategies that are used to cultivate expertise. Um, another concrete way I think we could better understand what people are doing and how uh, and what skills are important is to look closely at job descriptions and kind of do a, an analysis across a range of job descriptions. And finally, as, as Vivian noted, many of the places that we visited had a strong focus on education. And of course, you know, the, the interplay between education and uh, professional development is, is really important. And uh, understanding the sort of emerging curriculum for digital scholarship, I think, could give us a richer uh, understanding of, of what's important to emphasize in the curriculum. So our work um, has been of interest to people involved in kind of developing digital scholarship uh, degree programs and also give us a, a sense of sort of what's ahead. So we, we deliberately made our presentation brief because we want to really encourage questions and conversation. So let's, let's open up now for questions and conversations. Uh, and as John said, you're not being recorded. Well, you are, but they're, they're going to throw it out. Uh, so we, we welcome No matter any, how brilliant any, the question is, <laughs> it will be thrown out. We, we yes. welcome any questions you have, and we'd be happy to respond. Yeah. Any other Thank questions? Thank you. Yeah, you've been very patient. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.